So, I mean, I guess I got started kicking. I went to Notre Dame High School, same as Sailor, Chris. Um, I went there from a private Catholic, you know, K through eight over on the west side of the San Fernando Valley. And um, I knew uh, three or four people going there, Notre Dame. And one of them was going to play football. Brett Hayes, he's now a catcher. I think right now he's in spring training with the Texas Rangers, I believe. Um, Still one of my good buddies. I grew up playing soccer with him, um, and he was going to play. Well, the year before me at Notre Dame, there was another kid from St. Bernardine's who went to Notre Dame, and he was just going to kick. And I'm like, okay, that's a good way to meet friends. Brett's going to play football. Let's just go be a kicker because my big thing growing up was soccer. I'm still a huge soccer fan. I pay attention to uh, Manchester United. Um, I'm a German citizen like Sailor. So you guys- when the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when the U.S. gets knocked out, then I, I root for Germany. I'm, I root for the U.S. first no matter what, even if they're playing Germany. And then I root for uh, Germany afterwards. So um, I'm a soccer guy I'm still at heart. I, mean, I still love the game. I still wish I could play. But um, I wanted to, that's all I wanted to do was play soccer. So um, I kind of just went to Notre Dame to meet friends. That's kind of how I started playing. Um, it was in the summer of 99. I get a call from Coach Rooney there. Um, he called me up to say, hey, come to Valley College. And Chris Saylor, who's a former kicker here, and Saylor was just graduated maybe a year or two earlier from UCLA. And he goes, uh, Chris going to put you, the junior to be, who's Ryan Allen from my, my K through eight, who I knew, and then the senior to be through a workout and kind of help us learn. It was more of a an instructional day. And so I said, okay, sure, I'll show up. And this was kind of Chris's first – lesson that I think he probably ever taught besides maybe a one-on-one with a, you know, a friend or whatnot. So we go out to Valley College. I remember to this day, and it sticks in my mind, he had a huge rope. It was probably 40 yards long, and he was describing that every kick is a straight kick. And it, it resonates to me today playing still because playing up in the Northeast, whether it's at uh, MetLife Stadium here, up at Foxborough, you can't play a curveball. You have to play a straight ball and let the wind do a little bit of the work for you. Um, so that's the really stuck in my mind. So I had a pretty good workout. Coach Rooney asked me to, to join varsity. I come to, uh, you know, a time it was called hell week. I'm sure we can't call it hell week anymore um, <laughs> with varsity. Um, so we, um, I went, you know, I kind of, I was skipping all my, all my friends were playing JV. I think there was one other sophomore at the time playing varsity. And so I went up there and coach Rooney's uh, the nicest human you'll ever meet. And so he was going to give the senior the chance to play and then the junior. And then I had to really beat him out big time. Um, and so I wasn't playing. I didn't play much the first game. I just said, Hey, I'm still at the time just a soccer guy. I mean, we would go to soccer. We go to football practice for the first 30 minutes of practice, and then we leave and go to soccer. Uh, that was something that Sailor got instituted at Notre Dame because he was the same way. He was going to play soccer, um, and the only way he would kick is if he go to soccer practice. So uh, I said, "Look, I want to go play with my friends. I want to kick. I don't want to be sitting the sidelines here. You know, I just want to play at this point." So he said, "Okay, fine." So I gained some more experience, and then. Um, my junior year, I kicked, f- kicked off and punted and then, uh, we, and Ryan Allen was a field goal kicker and it really wasn't until probably, I guess it was the s- summer or spring, maybe late winter, early spring of 2000 and I guess that'd be 2001 that Chris really got the idea to kind of, you know, run some local camps around and use Notre Dame. And so I'd go, we had local kids and, uh, I was kind of his first recruit. So going into my senior year, he, I learned a lot. That's when I kind of took it a little more seriously, just give myself more options. Um, and Chris worked his tail off trying to help me a kick, be 
you know, walk on spot, a scholarship spot anywhere. Right. And um, I go to a UCLA kind of kicking camp type thing. Chris wasn't running it, but it was the finals or like the two they were going to offer was going to be Justin Medlock, who ended up committing to UCLA. And then if he didn't commit, they were going to offer me based on Chris's kind of recommendation. And I don't know if Justin would play the recommendation, but he was kicking the best at the camp at the time. And then um, he worked his tail off to get me a scholarship at Arizona, and it was awesome. Uh, I actually had more soccer scholarships than I did football coming out of high school. So I just kind of. Was that tough? Was that. So, I mean, you're going through all the. I mean, I remember Sarah talking about this, about his history. That has to be a little hard because your heart's kind of with soccer. Yeah, it was. And to this day, I don't know why I chose football. I kind of. So I went on my trip there. I went on a trip to. University of San Francisco for soccer. Um, I enjoyed it. I had a great time. And then the next trip I had was to Arizona for football. And the head coach, John McAfee, at the time needed to know if I was going to play football or not because he needed – or commit or not because he needed to offer another kicker for the class if I wasn't going to commit. So the last little meeting I had with him before I got to the – taking the airport, um, I looked at my mom and said, Mom, I'm playing football. <laughs> and to this day, I couldn't tell you why. Um, it just kind of – it felt right at the time. And um, I had a great time there. Uh, I didn't we, – we didn't have a good football team. I didn't – in I in, uh, redshirted. And in the five years there, we didn't go to a bowl game one time. So it was kind of rough. But it I had happens. a great time. had a lot of friends. Um, Tucson's a great town. I loved Arizona. Um, it and it then, obviously worked out well. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, it ended up working out pretty well. So, uh, and everyone asked, "Why didn't you play soccer, in Arizona?" Well, Arizona doesn't have a soccer team, men's soccer team. Oh um, really? Yeah, Title Nine stuff. So, the Pac twelve—I oh, right. don't know how the Pac twelve is, but the Pac ten at the time for soccer mm -hmm. was San Diego State, who's not even in the Pac ten or twelve for football or basketball. Mm -hmm. UCLA, Cal, Stanford, Oregon State, and Washington. So they had six teams in the Pac ten oh, at the time. That's fascinating. So it's just all Title IX stuff, and soccer was one that kind of got eliminated a little bit from the schools. And you think, oh, you could play soccer year round in Arizona, and you could for hands down. Yeah. But um, they just didn't have it. So um, I went to Arizona uh, first couple of years. Uh, my, I redshirted, obviously. Uh, next year, I just kicked off. They had a, a senior kicking field goals. And then um, my redshirt sophomore year, uh, we got a new coach, uh, Mike Stoops, come in. Had a pretty good say, spring. Uh, who, who's the coach for Stoops? It was John Makovic for two years. John Makovic. He ended up getting fired, mm -hmm. and then uh, Mike Stoops came in, and that's kind of, I guess, when I really truly bought into like the lifting. I would always run, being a soccer guy, I love to run. I love to be outside, do that stuff. The lifting stuff, I was kind of like, okay, what do I need this for? I can kick the ball far, you know, it doesn't matter. But um, I really started buying into the enjoying the the lifting part of it. And I still do. Uh, my wife gets mad at me because I go spend time almost too much time sometimes in the weight room. Cause I, I enjoy being in there. It's kind of my like sanctuary, if you will. So, um, bought in there, uh, kept in touch with Chris and he started running the Vegas camps, my true freshman year at Arizona. So I was, I just finished my first semester at Arizona. Really. I was just back at school and he flew me out to Vegas to um you know help run the camp and that was his first one and I, I don't even know if that first year he did a uh a one in may or not or he might have and we might have been in spring ball or something and i couldn't make it but um so i was kind of i was his first recruit really and then he kind of yeah. got going with the vegas thing and that kind of took off and it's still you know you kind of bypassed a lot of what people think of Sarah now like you you were his oh first, yeah you're his first student but even before he was chris Sarah kicking which is kind of Really oh, yeah. interesting. I, I, I have the original T-shirt still in my in my house in Dallas. So the I got thick, the thick, uncomfortable ones. The oh, it, no, it, yeah, and you know the logo he has now, yeah. like that. Like yeah. he had like a literally a football on your chest here that just had like, like it. It seemed like you went to Microsoft Word, found a football, and then just wrote Chris Taylor kicking and blue across it. I still have that. I still have two of them. I think one just a regular shirt he gave me, and then the one with my number on it from one of the games he ran. Was, he had his was, your number, was your number like one because you're like the only one? Or? Uh, no, we, I think I was like number five or something because uh, there were a few people there. Yeah. But his brother was out there running, help, helping do the filming, and they were filming yeah. from all over the place. Um, like, like this is how old it was. We were working on onside kicks. We were working on squib kicks. 
Wow. Now it's just he didn't work on any of that stuff anymore. Yeah, it's no. not, that becomes a, a coaching decision, not a you know a talent level decision. Because if you can hit onside kicks, but you can't kick the ball to the goal line or deeper, mm-hmm. then there's no point right. in offering your scholarship. Right. So um, I bypass all that stuff. I mean, I, I literally I went to a few camps in Notre Dame that he was running, and then um, kind of a little funny story. So he. He was pushing hard because he knew oh, – who was it at Arizona? I forget. There was a coach at Arizona he knew that was there um, when I first got there. And he was pushing hard for it. And a guy, a defensive lineman from Notre Dame was going to Arizona. Uh, he committed to play. And they he sent in a game film of – Notre Dame was playing – oh, what team were we playing? I forget the team, but the game, I kicked the 50 and 52-yard field goal. So he sent in the whole game film. He just didn't send in his clips, which you can do now easily. This is – literally, we're sending VHS back yeah. in the day. <laughs> so uh, he sent the whole game film. They watched it, and they're like, oh, who's this kid? They called me up, and then that's kind of when the connection started with Chris and, and Arizona. And, um, you know, that's kind of how it goes. And still to this day, I uh, – well, getting back, so – at Arizona, I started taking it a little more seriously. And when I really kind of thought I could have a chance in the NFL was um, probably going into my senior year. So okay. I, um, one of my best friends, we came in together at Arizona. He didn't redshirt. I did. He's a punter. His senior year, my redshirt junior year, with five games left, he tore his ACL. He was leading the NCAA in gross, and probably I think he was top five in net at the time. Wow. And uh, I'm having a great year. He still went to the Ray Guy Award as a finalist, even though he didn't miss the last five games for his ACL. So he was he was having a really good year. Yeah. And then he ended up getting uh, picked up as a free agent to the Bengals. And that's when I'm like, oh, I, I got a chance at this. I can, you know, at least have a chance and, you know, try, and try an NFL camp type thing. And then I had a pretty decent senior season. Uh, or before senior season, I went out and Saylor had just started. That might have been the first year of – the college camp where the college kids come out yeah. you know, and stay. And we stayed at, I mean, we trained in Notre Dame. So it was home for me. I stayed right. at a hotel with everybody and did all that fun stuff to see my family. Um, and I kind of, it kind of, I guess if you will say clicked then, like I kind of like got into a pretty good groove then and take, took that into my senior season. And then um, had a decent senior season. Like I said, we weren't great. So we didn't get a ton of opportunities. And then um, went, to the com or went to senior bowl, had a pretty good senior bowl, went to the combine, had a pretty good combine, a couple of workouts. And then kind of out of nowhere, my agent and I, we were, or they weren't at my house, but we had a little get together the draft weekend. Uh, this is back on the draft only two days. And then, uh, the Cowboys called not really out of nowhere, but I didn't have too much contact with them. They called and, uh, asked if I wanted to be a cowboy. And I said, yeah, sure. It'd be fun. And so then, I, guess, uh, I guess I'll be a cowboy. I yeah. guess I'll be a cowboy. <laughs> and then, uh, then it kind of got started. And um, since then, I've, I'll go see Chris whenever I can, whenever I get back to L.A. Um, or if he comes to Dallas or the New Jersey area, mm-hmm. um, I'll see him whenever I can to you know, get some training in. Um, it's, it's just hard. I, I love to because yeah. it, it's easy. He, can, he, he and I, we talk the same language. And if, like, a younger, you know, probably a high school kid were, were listening to us talk. They'd probably a lot of it go over our head or over their head. So we get to the little finer details, mm-hmm. um, which are hard to understand because there's so much stuff going on that you can make things a lot easier, a lot simpler. And um, when you get to the highest level to make it the easiest right. you need to be to just to make it the smoothest. So um, I get back whenever I can to train with him. I know he's a busy man. He's got four kids. I have uh, three and a fourth on the way. So wow. I'll be joining his boat uh, here pretty soon. Yeah. But um, it's just tough. So we, we try to right. – we stay in touch quite often. But as far as uh, getting together to kick and train, it's it's tough. But um, I can imagine that. He's, um, he's great. He's awesome. I uh, have a ton of respect for him. Uh, he's worked his tail off, not only for me, but for my family. I have a – Two younger brothers, right. um, Greg, who ended up playing soccer, was a much better soccer player than I ever was. So, um, And then my little brother, Eric, uh, he played soccer. I think he tore his ACL in his freshman or sophomore year of high school, and that's when he just stuck to kicking. He said, I'm just going to be a kicker, and he took it seriously, and Chris helped him develop and 
become a pretty good kicker. And he went to University of Washington and a couple big kicks there against USC and yeah. Notre Dame and stuff like that. Oh, so yeah. um, he's he's done a lot for not only me, but for my family. So I'm uh, forever grateful. So that's kind of my lineage with Chris and then the whole Notre yeah. Dame thing and all that stuff. So Yeah, you got a lot of connections. It's awesome with him. Yeah. So if, if how how would you describe him if if to someone who's never met Chris Saylor, what would you how would you describe him? How would I just oh gosh. Um he's one of the most loyal people I've ever met. Um and he's brutally honest, especially when it comes to kicking, because he has to be, because when you're doing something right or wrong, uh you he, he has to be able to tell you that so he can so you can improve, you can get better, you can learn. And that is one of his best traits because you see so many coaches, uh, maybe not necessarily in the kicking world, but coaches in general who try to beat around the bush or just kind of give you the, the goods and they let out, they don't tell you the bad stuff. Well, you learn from the mistakes. At least that's what I've learned from most. The, the, my good kicks, I'm like, you kind of store those in your memory bank or the bad kicks you want to learn from. You want to make sure you emphasize what you're doing wrong. And he's, uh, he's great at that. Like I said, he's awesome at the detail stuff. He's, we talk about the smallest of things from, uh, you know, weight transfer, weight placement, and all that little little stuff that kind of goes unnoticed. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, I can just go back here and start here and kick a football. Right. And it, it becomes a little more than that when you get to a little higher level. Mm-hmm. Um, and so – and then the loyalty part, like, I – it's hard for me to go training with anyone. You know, I, uh, I learn more from him than anyone else. It's just it, – we kind of speak the same language. We've been on the same page since 1999, really. So it's been yeah. a long time coming. We're we're we'll be friends here for almost 20 years coming up pretty soon. So uh, yeah. it's kind of it's gone so fast that it it I don't even know where the I, mean, I remember <laughs> that day at Valley College like yesterday. It's just crazy. So that is amazing. That's amazing. And so I mean, what's kind of fascinating about your story too is that you're you kind of blazed the trail for everyone and everyone and then the kicking chris taylor kicking world followed it's sort of catching up to you especially now in the pros where you see a lot of kickers now i want to say i want to say 18 in are in the nfl or or chris taylor guys yeah Um, and it's awesome it's amazing it's so much fun to watch and it's fun it's cool when you're a part of that world whether you're a rubio long snapper or chris taylor kicker you always hear what's going on you are always part of the grapevine you are always yeah. catching little things that are going on in the world. And it's just, it's, it's kind of domination at this point. <laughs> yeah. It, and it's kind of weird because the young kids coming out that I've helped at a Chris Taylor camp and now they're like competing with me or I'm playing against them or something like that. It's kind of weird. And for a kicker, I guess I'm not terribly old. I mean, I'm going into my 11th NFL season, which is kind of crazy thing about, yeah. but for some of these guys, I remember talking, this was in 2015, I guess it was, uh, Dustin Hopkins, we played the Redskins, oh. and he came up to me right after the game, he said, hey, I want to thank you at a Chris Taylor camp, you helped me do this or that, whatever it was, I kind of forget, but it kind of, it sticks in my mind, and uh, now, being a little bit older, you see these guys coming through that have, you know, and a lot of guys go to a lot of different coaches, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the more coaches you go to, the more exposure, the more you learn to a degree. Um, but it's kind of crazy that it's, it's all, all these guys that you kind of coached and helped through the way have now made it this far. Another good example. So my second NFL game, we are playing, uh, the Miami Dolphins in Miami, the Dallas Cowboys on the dirt in the old, or, you know, at the, at the, at the stadium there. Yeah. And, um, Blair Walsh was being honored as a high school senior, <laughs> At halftime, I'm like kicking and I'm like, they say like, Blair Wallace, yeah, a field goal kicker for wherever you went to high school, committed to Georgia. And I'm like, I know that name. Like, it's a sailor guy. Like, I know yeah, that. Yeah. And then, you know, five years later, he gets drafted or whatever it is. And, yeah. you know, we're playing against each other and stuff like that. So um, it's kind of crazy how it all kind of falls into place. But um, it's it's been it's been a great ride. Hopefully I can keep it going for a couple more years. Well, I mean, well, I mean, you've had an amazing career and your, your career's kind of had a little bit of it all. Too. Oh yeah. If you, oh, look, yeah. If you look at the history, and, and that's the kind of fun part I want to talk to you about was so you, you you played for the big thing I want to talk about too is I always try to tell people and when talk about this is the exposure kickers get and the microscope that they're under. 
Oh it's, yeah. And it's so skewed. <laughs> always it's always usually skewed. It's usually uh uh really unfair cuz people just don't have a clue on what it and what what it's about or the true dynamics of that of the position. Yeah. So for you yep. and and with you you've played for the two art you know for NFL the two biggest media markets. Oh yeah. The two biggest <laughs> franchises that are under a serious microscopes from the Dallas Cowboys to the New York Jets and having the New York media. I mean that has to be such a uh, amazing learning experience. <laughs> yeah, so I, I get to um, I get to Dallas, Arizona. Like ha- we kind of after practice, the media department would, um, you know, just call out the names they needed for the few Tucson papers, or if the ESPN came before a g- big game or whatnot. Didn't get much exposure there. Whatever, it was fine. Get mm-hmm. to Dallas, and the f- way. Um, it was Wade Phillips' first year when I got there, so mm-hmm. they at the time you could have two mini camps for the veterans, and they they decided to have their first mini camp um, when all the rookies showed up, and then a second one later. So show up, uh, you know, do my weight, height, all that stuff, and then you know you see like T.O., you see Tony Romo, you see Jason Witten, you see Demarcus Ware, all these guys in the locker room. Like, what is going on here? Where am I? It's like surreal. And then all of a sudden the media comes in after practice or before practice, whatever it was, I forget. And there's just 50 people, cameras, microphones everywhere. And so you're like, all right, and what's this, going and, on? And, and this comes in, they come in right in the locker room, right? This isn't like, no, oh, go, yeah. go, go to the team conference room. No, they're coming in the locker oh, room. Oh, yeah. They, they come in and they're, they're watching you change. <laughs> they're watching you get dressed and stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely like the big boy world. And yeah. um, so – there's everyone in there, and they want to talk to all the draft picks, obviously. So I talked to a few people. I kind of just kind of fly on the radar. I have a pretty good first year. Um, ended up going to the Pro Bowl, kind of luckily go to the Pro Bowl. And then um, – so my second year, had another really good year. So the media is kind of – I don't talk too much. Like one of the biggest times was uh, Monday night, my first Monday night game. We were playing in Buffalo. Had a pretty good game. Had a couple field goals at the end to, to win it. Mm-hmm. And um, I had to go – on the podium where I haven't I've gone on the podium one time in my career in front of everyone. They're like, ah, Nick, we're going to, cause in Buffalo, the, the locker room is pretty small. So they didn't want everyone around my locker where guys are getting dressed and stuff. So like, Nick, we're just pushing at the podium to so go to the podium. You get, you get dressed, go to the podium, you answer a bunch of questions. It's kind of fun to be up there. You're kind of like the president, you know, people sitting right. down there asking questions and you're up at this podium. Hey, okay, cool. <laughs> so, um, that was kind of my first exposure with that. And then, uh, I had a, had a good time with media. I, I did. And then going into my third year, I had hip surgery a little bit late. Um, oh, that's right. You, you, you had a, and this happened your second year though, right? Didn't you play through it? I played through it last about five games or so. Uh-huh. And um, it was kind of a misdiagnosis. It was treat. It was acting like a hip flexor strain. So the docs uh-huh. thought it was, and you, you couldn't, unless you had a very, very trained eye, see the labrum tear through okay. an MRI and you needed to send it to a, hip specialist or a, a radiologist who could understand what a torn labrum looked like a small, small torn labrum in the hip looked like. So, um, we ended up like, you know, doing a couple MRIs and kind of gets lost in the shuffle. And then, um, I go to Vail, Colorado, have hip surgery there, do all my rehab. And I had my surgery 12 weeks to the day that we started training camp before we started training camp. So I'm like, right, I'm getting, I'm making it back to training camp. You know, I'm just going to push it. Well, now they're telling, I mean, at the time they're saying, yeah, three to four months, you could do it. So that was three, three months. You could be back now with that same hip surgery. They're saying, you know, four to six, maybe even seven months. So I kind of pushed it a little too hard, got back to camp. I started the year fairly well, had a, you know, kind of a few ups and downs. And then end of the year, I just didn't have any endurance left in my leg. Like making a 40 yard field goal felt like I needed to kick it 65 yards. Yeah. So, um, and 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 did, did you have pain the whole time? Like, could you? No, I, I didn't have any pain after I had the surgery. Okay. Um, it was, I was pain free. I just was struggling mentally, yeah. struggling physically as far as the endurance, the strength that I, I just cut training from January one, which, you know, I take some time off anyway, but training from the end of the season until the beginning of training camp, I didn't get to do a whole lot of a sports specific training, like kicking. The, I got to actually kick footballs a week or two before training camp, and that was it. So I, I missed six months of kicking. Um, where, for example, 
uh, I just started kicking today. You know, I took seven, eight weeks off at the end of our season, started kicking today, and I'll gradually build up uh, throughout the course of the off season. You know, take a week off here. I got all kind of mapped out on my calendar or, mm-hmm. with our plans, but mm-hmm. I mean, that's taking six, seven months off from kicking and then kind of, all right, go, go to training camp, go to yeah. preseason, go kick. So um, it was tough. Uh, you know, I got released end of the season there. Um, they were making a playoff run. They kind of had to do it. Yeah. I understood it. I get it. Um, I'm grateful to Jerry. I'm grateful to everyone at the organization for giving me the chance. And then, um, so I, I kind of took some time off after that started training some more and I got back into really good shape, started kicking really well again, uh, came up to New York, had a workout with the giants and the jets back to back day. So I flew in on a Wednesday, had a workout with the giants on Thursday, drove they, and their facility is at the stadium and our, the jets facility is 45 minutes from the stadium ish. So right after the workout drove down here to the jets facility, uh, had dinner with the special teams coaches, you know, had a little meeting with them. Worked out the next day, uh, go do my physical. They didn't want me to leave until I signed the contract. So I said, give me the weekend. Let me, you know, think about it a little bit. And then uh, we ended up signing on the next Monday. And, uh, you know, everything kind of happens for a reason in kind of every walk of life, whether it's having kids or this or football. So um, we've kind of – we enjoy New Jersey. Um, we have a great time up here. It's it's fun. And then – that my first year here, we go to the AFC Champion Games. We have a really good team. Um, that was fun. And you, and you had and, you, and that was, was that the same year you beat the Colts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you had, and you had that you know, that game. Now I just watched that. Uh, I pulled up YouTube. I want to see what their what videos you had on on YouTube. <laughs> I was out there, everyone. And you had two. The first two that well, that's actually, actually three. Uh, there was the first, and this is why, like, I think this is a perfect example of what the kicking world was like. The first one was this uh, local news channel that came to your home about two years ago. With it came to, uh, they came in like you know met met your family and all that stuff. Okay, and, and yeah, it was really cool. So that, was it the, was it the SNY one? Where SNY, they were like yeah, yeah, my yeah, 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 Wife yeah. doing a workout yeah. stuff. All right, you got you. She, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she kills it, man. Oh yeah, she's yeah. upstairs working out right now. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they had that one. The second one was off of someone's cell phone, and it, the title is literally "Nick Folk is the worst kicker in NFL history." And yep. then the third one was you with the uh, game when he kick, and uh, the game when he kick, you can hear you. It's about halfway. You kick <laughs> the ball, and you, the ball is halfway up in the air, and you just hear you just go, <laughs> and just get psyched. And it was so cool. It's so awesome to see that. Then everyone yeah, silent went and goes nuts. Yeah, you kind of you know you're. Everyone asks like, do you think about? you know, a game winning kicks and celebrating and stuff. And I can 100% honestly say, you know, I try to treat every kick the same, whether it's a game winner to, you know, the first quarter kick to an extra point, whatever it is. So I try to treat them all the exact same. Now, as soon as the ball kind of leaves my foot and I've finished my follow through and I've kind of picked my eyes up a little bit to see where it's going. um, And I kind of know what's happening with it. Whatever happens after that, I couldn't tell you. You know, and I, I, you know, during the course of the game, there's not much that kind of it happens. I'll like give my holder a high five and, you know, give the lineman in my snapper high five. And, um, you know, I'm real appreciative of all of them because the pounding in the NFL that, so in a normal offense or defensive play, uh, offensive lineman has a chance to protect himself or yes. a run play. they're trying to run a guy over yes um, pass play they get a pass set and you know they might get bull rush sure but they have a chance to protect themselves right on a field goal play they have to literally sit there and be as big as they can take a beating for 1.3 to 1.5 seconds and literally just sit there and just get punched in the face i mean i'm not literally but you know you can have much. 600 pound guys or 600 pounds of men just running right at you and you got to take it. Right. Uh, and right. You're, you're a snapper. You probably got it from, you know, in college and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I'm real appreciative of those guys. Those guys do a great job. I know I'm going a little side tangent here, but, uh, every Christmas you, I get you, them you, all little <laughs> gifts. Uh, oh, do you? That ain't, oh yeah. That ain't that's kind of, I heard about that. Like, you know, running backs getting guys, their linemen gifts. If they right. go over a thousand yards, back, or whatever. Yeah. So I'm like, first year, I just got, got him a bottle of wine or whatever. And then it's kind of morphed into like, you know, fun little gifts that I kind of find that are just random stupid things. So, That's awesome. um, but 
I, you know, course of the game, I give them all high fives. Just kind of, you know, thank them, you know, good drive, whatever, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and then end of the game, I got whatever happens, happens. I couldn't tell you what happens after, right. uh, after the ball is my foot. And a lot of times it's fist pumping and yelling. And, yeah. uh, my second year I had a 50 yard game winner against the Cowboys. My second year, um, at the Jets. So my, uh, was that my fifth year in the NFL? It was 2011. Um, we were playing on 9 11. Yeah. So it was a 10 year anniversary. I remember, yes. Playing against the Dallas Cowboys was my team, my old team. And uh, I kind of, I, I had a good game going. I made a field goal earlier and we were tied. Is it, we were tied? Yeah, we were tied 24 24. The Royal Reeves picks off Romo. We run back down and a 50 yard field goal and no time on the clock. And uh, ended up making it. And for whatever reason, I don't know why I like, I do one fist pump towards our sideline and then I turn and do one fist pump towards their sideline. <laughs> and I, I couldn't tell you why I honestly, honest to God, couldn't tell you why, but it happened. And, uh, I'm sure it was like some subliminal thing that yeah. just kind of was going through at that time. But, right. um, so whatever the celebrations that occur, be it the, that, that game, the Colts game winner or that yeah. Cowboys game winner or, I know when I was with the Cowboys, the game winner in Buffalo, I just ran all over the field like a soccer player. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. what I was doing. So whatever it kind of happens, happens, and everyone celebrates their own way. Just kind of mm-hmm. you hope that the celebration stays, you know, calm-ish and collected-ish. Right. right. Um, so, but um, – But I've yeah, had a couple know, big big kicks here, big game winners here, which have been fun. Though. So, Like, I feel oh, like, yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah, you've yeah. earned that. You earn that. When you do, when you, because you go through, because the thing about specialists, you go through, you're, you're under the radar so much. And then you finally have this opportunity to, you know, to really, uh, you know, make a big mark on a game. Yeah. And, uh, and when you do it, you, you have to be just overwhelmed with emotions at that point. So oh, I, I yeah, totally understand sure. it. And, and I think you deserve it. I'm yeah, happy. It's fun. It. It, yeah. It's, it's kind of, I was, so I had the opportunity. Uh, a couple of years ago during an off season, this is before we had kids. This was probably in 2012 ish. Um, go to a couple of Red Bull, New York Red Bulls games, um, mm-hmm. became really good friends. So one of their, one of their player, former players, he just got traded Dax McCarty. He played with my brother on the youth national team and they were roommates uh, in residency. So I knew Dax. I went to the all American uh, McDonald's all American game. I knew him a little bit, didn't know him well. So, after one of the games, I said hello to him. We kind of became a little bit friends. He lived in the city, though, so uh, I didn't get to see him too much. But um, went to a bunch of games. I ended up getting to meet Thierry Henry, the you know the big time soccer global icon. Um, mm-hmm. And he was he wasn't traveling to an away game for some reason. He might have been just injured a little bit or whatever it was. So um, he we go and play soccer with him. He goes, yeah, come play. All right, so we go play, and we start talking. We, you know, we we had this bit before we had met a few times before. So this is probably our fifth time hanging out, or whatever. And he was asked. We brought I brought a football. I goes, bring a football. I want to try to kick one. All right, fine. So I bring a football, and we're messing around. We play some soccer. We kick some footballs around, and he goes, "How do you go out there, and you're cold, as far as game experience goes? Mm-hmm. You just no, not on the field. How do you go out there and just kick the ball?" And I said, "Well, it, it becomes a." a conditioned thing that you kind of learn over time. Um, but you're staying loose in the sidelines and he goes, I couldn't do it. He goes, that'd be like me coming in off the sidelines, off the bench and kicking a penalty kick to win the game or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever it is. And I said, right. Oh yeah, that's, that's how it is. Right. Um, but he, he couldn't fathom it. He goes, I, I like playing mind games with the goalie the whole time. So if I get a PK at the end of the game or we're in penalty kicks, I can play mind games with the goalies and at that point they don't know what's going to happen. And I said, well, I'm not, I don't have to play a mind game with anyone. Yeah. I, I want to stay out of my own mind. I just have to kick a ball through yellow uprights. Mm-hmm. That's my job. There's no one. Yes. The defenders are coming. And as long as I get it high enough, I'll be okay. Right. I mean, as long as it goes high enough and then the accuracy part is what I have to worry about the most. So you got people who just can't understand it. Sometimes they don't get it. Um, and then reporters get on you all, all the time about a missed kick or a block kick or whatever it may be. And it's like everyone expects you to be perfect because in the course of a year, this year, for example, we had 20, 
four extra points, which was kind of low. Our offense wasn't great. And 30 field goals, so we had 54 opportunities to make the ball go through the uprights. Um, and they want you to be perfect 54 times. Well, right. that's hard. I mean, yes. asking a, you know, I, I mean, doing that with no, with just on your sticks is hard enough from different distances, different winds, different everything. That's hard enough, mm-hmm. let alone a snap hold kick or a rush come in where you have, you know, six foot nine guys trying to block kicks and stuff like that. So it's, you try to be as accurate as possible. You try to make it as consistent as possible. And that's the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really hard to perfect. That's why you're not going to see many, if any, or I think there's been one perfect seasons or perfect careers. It's just too hard to perfect. And then, um, it's, uh, it's fun I mean, today. Like I, I, I challenge myself every day. I go out and kick to be perfect. Um, you know, today I was, but today it was an easy day, just a short, <coughs> excuse me, short little day, but it was fun. Well, you kind of brought it up and I want to talk about this because I remember this, this is when I talk about the grapevine, you know, people bringing stuff to my attention because I'm just, or through social media, or whatever, <coughs> I kind of, you catch wind of it is back this season when that one reporter, uh, I, and I guess there's a week where they, you know, uh, kickers were struggling with extra points. Yeah, and this one reporter wrote this article, and I remember reading the article and was thinking, like, "What the hell?" And God, God bless your wife, <laughs> went on there and defended it. And I a thousand percent agree with everything she said because a lot of the article was nonsense. I mean, oh, there's, yeah. there was a lot of stuff he said. Talk about margin. It's time to marginalize kickers, keep them on the mm-hmm. sideline. Uh, the big one that got me fired up was the uh, they're just uh, con- there's what, what was the. <laughs> He's uh, like contract yeah, worker, yeah, it contract, be, whatever yeah, it is, consultants, yes, and yeah, uh, fire me up. And oh, well, it you learn to get so when Rex Ryan was here, mm-hmm. and I learned it a long time ago, he, he would always say it have skin as thick as an armadillo, and that's kind of when I read it, I didn't really read it, I don't particularly to read too much of it because we were on a bye week so it had nothing mm-hmm. to do with me the article right. had nothing right. to do with me it was just right. kickers in general right and um i i didn't take offense to it i told my wife if anything comes about it unless they attack me personally like as a person mm-hmm. then you can say something but they attack me as a kicker as an athlete whatever that's that's i have to live with that i'm okay right. with it i don't care right um and so the article i just kind of blew it off i'm like whatever it's mm-hmm. He, he doesn't understand it. I love to come, no. you know, to teach him a little bit, you know, to, to, yes. like I don't ever want to be a reporter, so I don't try to understand mm-hmm. why people write the things they do. But, um, you know, she's like, she took a little bit of offense to it because he was attacking the way I put food on the table for my family. Yes. So that, that yes. hurt. That's where it got her. And if it wasn't so derogatory towards kickers, I don't think she would have said much, but she, I think the biggest thing that it got was, she was just attacking the way that I, I provide for my family. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, well, I, well, yeah. I mean, I, besides what she said, I mean, she she wanted there and she made some great points. But I think I think with me, I re- after reading the article again recently, there's a lot of things that you know we talk about the web series we want to do, and and is big thing is bring light to this world. And a lot of things yep. he said was things that we want to touch upon. Like the, uh, he at one point he named every, almost he named every uh, a lot of kickers. He named at least ten. And he said, all of them are the same. Yeah. And that was something I think is a big misconception. It's oh, all, yeah. All yeah. Are the same. That's, one, that's one thing I, I love about Chris, where mm-hmm. you get a lot of coaches out there who want to teach it one way only. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't kick the same as Justin Tucker, who had one of the best seasons of all time. Mm-hmm. I don't kick the same as Dan Bailey, who's the second best field kicker of all time as far as percentage goes mm-hmm. um i don't kick the same as adam vinatieri who's probably going to go to the hall of fame mm-hmm. i don't kick the same as the now hall of famer um morton anderson right. so everyone kicks differently now there are things that lots of great kickers do similarly but everyone gets to that point differently and so the way chris teaches it which i agree with is we, he teaches concepts more than he does teach straight technique. This is how it has to be done. He says, this is what needs to happen, how you get there. There's options to get there. 
And mm. the best, some of the best options that I've seen with really good kickers are this, this, this. And, you know, some, some people like look, will look at Justin Tucker and say, God, I don't know how he makes picks. But he does a lot of things right if you look at it and right. break it down. But he's perfected his kick. And I perfected my kick. And so-and-so has perfected their kick. Everyone does it differently. And so you can't say everyone's the same because, A, physically not everyone's built the same. I'm probably one of the you're, tallest yeah, so and you're big biggest. For a, for a place kicker. Like, yeah, I'm probably one of the tallest yeah. and biggest kickers. But also in between the years, every kicker is different. Everyone handles pressure differently. Everyone handles mm-hmm. the situations differently. And everyone asks me, why do you like the end of the games? And I say, well, that's when you – it's your time to shine. That's the fun part for me. Um and everyone says, well, how do you handle the pressure? I said, I embrace it. I try to use it to my advantage where a lot of people are going to try to use their energy to ignore the crowd, ignore the moment, ignore it. Well, you're using this energy that you need to be using to make the kick right. when you're using it to push things away. Use it to enhance you. Use it yeah. to like, you know, um, you try to – what's a good movie out there um, where they just kind of like focus – everything on like limitless almost a movie limitless where he takes yeah. a pill yeah you kind of yeah. use the energy and you just kind of like bring all that focus and attention to one thing and that's making the field goal right. and you just kind of like focus on that and just think about what you need to do to make it and that's what i do that's how i approach it and i can guarantee you not many other guys are like that everyone's got their own way of handling the pressure situation so not everyone's the same so right. that's that's along the whole specialist world whether it's right. a punter or a snapper or a kicker a lefty or righty, anyone, any, yeah. everyone's different. Um, and that's how it should be. And it should be the same way. I mean, Clayton Kershaw doesn't throw the same as Sandy Koufax or as Randy Johnson, but they're all really good pitchers, mm-hmm. um, lefty pitchers at that. They all, mm-hmm. and it is what it is. You can't say everyone's the same because everyone's got different personality traits, different physical traits. And so, I mean, I, like I said, I didn't read the article too much. My wife kind of read me bits and pieces of it. Right. I didn't take, I don't, I stay away from it because it doesn't, as you should, it doesn't pertain to me personally. It pertained to me work wise, which I just kind of let go. Um, but it, like there's an attack on my family or me personally, then it'd be a little yeah. different story. But yeah, it's totally understandable. Um, so, I mean, it, look, he I has feel- his right to write it, and a lot of people are going to agree or disagree with it. Yeah. And it was, you know, I think it was a, a maybe an article to get a little reaction out of people because yeah. that weekend there were the most missed extra points in NFL history. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what the NFL wanted when they moved the extra point back 13 right. yards. They wanted misses. Yeah. They didn't want to. The, the theory was they wanted instead of 99.5% of the time you get one point, they wanted you to get one point 90 to 92% of the time, right. and then you get two points 50% of the time. So in theory, going for two – Makes sense because every you go for two, let's say four times a game, you're gonna get four points. You go for let's just let's just say ten times. Let's just make it even numbers. You mm-hmm. you go for two ten times, you're gonna get ten points. You kick extra point ten times, you're gonna get nine points. That's what they're looking at. That's what they want the coaches to make a decision. They don't just want them to go get one point. Just go right. add the, the extra right. point. They want it to make it where the coaches have a decision to make. Yeah, it's and, not so automatic anymore. Not such an yeah. automatic thing. Okay, this is just part of the game. It does make the game interesting, I think. Oh, yeah, and I mean, even a, a missed extra point will make your – you're down three or you're up yeah. three, yeah. and instead of up four, it makes it a little more, you know, a little more interesting. So yeah. um, that's what the NFL wanted, and that's what they got. So you I can't – For sure. I think you know, and then it has happened, yeah. The, the, the teams that have an advantage are the teams that play inside eight-plus games a year because – the elements, like, I mean, one end of MetLife is just a pain in the butt to kick in sometimes. And um, you get a gnarly wind in your face, and it goes left to right sometimes. So you gotta you got to figure out what, where you're going to hit the ball. And you have to hit an extra point just as cleanly as you would hit a 50-yard field goal in many stadiums. Right. Now, the teams that get to play inside have a little bit of an advantage because they get uh, – you could hit – you get away with hitting a bad ball. Yeah, to a degree, and you can still make it. So, um, yeah, I mean, the NFL does it to enhance the game. They want to make the game fun. They want to keep it entertaining. So, um, you know, it is what it is. But the other thing they don't think about, and this is coming from I've said this publicly many times, they don't think about the injury rate of the linemen. That, because an old extra point, in theory, 
was fourth and two. So a team might rush six guys. They'll drop a couple to make sure you're no fake. Well, now, the new extra point, it's in theory fourth and 15. Well, you're going you're gonna to bring the house. You're going to drop one guy. You're going to bring 10 guys. Yeah. A lot of times you're going to hit one guy with two yeah. or three. Yeah. And so the ru- – the, and I've asked my lineman. I said, with the old extra point versus new extra point, where do they rush harder? And they said, oh, the, the new extra point rule, hands down. Better chance of blocks, uh, less chance of fake. And if they block it, they can return it for two where the old extra point, when it was blocked, it was dead. Yeah. So they're giving incentive to make the play more interesting. I get it. But they don't think – I mean, they're talking about health conscious. They want to keep the game healthy. They don't think about that. That's – some teams like the, the uh, Broncos a couple years ago, they scored 73 touchdowns. So let's just say they kick 70 extra points. That's 70 extra times that – the linemen just get had yeah. to take a beating to the face. That's a great so, point. Um, I, I don't know if there's been any major injuries. I know one year uh, Rob Gronkowski broke his forearm on an extra point. He was the wing. This was from the two yard line, and and uh, all all the defender did was he tried to chop his arm down to cut the corner, mm-hmm. and he he hit it in the right spot at the right time and yeah. broke Rob's forearm. Yeah. So um, that's kind of how I see that. But um, made sense though. It, it, it is kind of – it's their way of just keeping it interesting. That's what it is. So, Do you, do you see any other kind of uh, things that the NFL or football, whether it's college or anything, that might do to kicking to change it up? Uh, I mean, I, I think – I don't know what the – so this past year there was a rule put in place that touchbacks now went to the 20-yard line. Um. Or to the 25, 25 excuse 25, me, yeah. the 25, so they, they adopted the college rule. Well, teams like the New England Patriots are like, well, the ball at the 21-yard line is better than the ball at the 25, so we're just going to kick it to the 2-yard line and make you to return it to the 25. So, to beat us. I mean, that's if you if yeah. you get to the 26, then okay, fine. If you get to the 20, well, we win. Or if you get worse than the 20, we're, we're winning big time. Mm-hmm. And it was very evident Super Bowl. Um mm-hmm. The Falcons tried to return one or two at the end of the game, and they got to the 12-yard line or 15-yard line. And so they didn't have great field position. So um, the theory behind that is just, okay, the, the, you're going to get 25 either way, so we're going to bank on our coverage team that we're going to stop that every time. That's what wow. some teams went with. Wow. Where the NFL thought every team will just hit it in call the end it zone, in, call and, it in. Yeah, be safe. and then they'll just take a knee in the end zone. Well – some teams did that. Mm-hmm. If you were playing a really, really good returner, you probably said, all right, we're in touchbacks. I don't want this guy to win the game. We'll, we'll play defense from the 25-yard line. If you're playing a return team where you know what their returns are or the returner is banged up or they have their second team returner in, you're probably going to say, let's just put it in the corner. We'll defend half the field, and we'll tackle them inside the 25. Mm-hmm. Instead of before, it was like, okay, we got to tackle them inside the 20. Let's just hit a touchback or hit it as far as we can. And then we'll give them the ball at the 20. Because even, let's just say, and I was telling people this earlier too, uh, or this season. So I don't know how much it, this increased scoring, but another thing the NFL might have had in the back of their mind was it might increase scoring. Well, let's say all things being equal, weather, elements, everything. A team gets the ball to the 25-yard line. They drive 40 yards. So they drive or to the 20-yard line. They, the t- old touchback rule, they get the ball at 20. They drive 40 yards. They get to the opposite 40. Punt, really. Ball to 25. You drive 40 yards, you're probably kicking a field goal with most kickers these days. All things being equal. Now, late in the season, you might not kick a 53-yard field goal. But indoors, in the Super Bowl, for example, you're going to kick a 53-yard field goal. You're going to have confidence your kicker's going to make that. So, I don't – that extra five yards, I don't know how much the scoring went up, per se. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. Um, But – that's kind of another thing that was in the back. So you hit a, a ball to the, like, yeah, there's just a five yards difference. All you need is an extra five yards in one draw or the same amount of yards to get into field goal range that you had from the 20. Um, so it's kind of a, I, I know what they're trying to do. I don't know. <clears throat> it was a test rule for the year. The, the kickoff, the touchback rule, the 25. So I don't know if they'll vote it in 100% if concussions were down or injuries were down or what it was. So if they voted in 100%, then 
<clears throat> we'll kind of see. But pretty soon, right. I think, the, I mean, the Pro Bowl, I, I don't know if it, that went back, but a couple years ago, the Pro Bowl, they just eliminated kickoffs altogether. They just put the ball to 25-yard yeah. line. Yeah. So I don't know if it's going to start or go that way. My thought is it won't. My thought is that the helmets will start to catch up to the speed of the game, and there will be better helmets in the game pretty soon here where the injuries, we hope, will be decreased. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so they'll hopefully keep the kickoff in. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, it's kind of a <laughs> unique part of any sport. It's like very unique to, to football, American football as it is, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of like encompasses everything that is football in that yeah, one. Yeah, well, I agree. And, that, and it's always fun to watch. I mean, and, and, and I still remember like in high school, I played, you know, I was playing on, playing on kickoff coverage and even on kickoff return, it was like, it was just a man up kind of situation. Like yeah, <laughs> just, no, no fear dodging that stuff. You, just, yeah. you better run down. You better hit your guy or he's going to yeah. tackle or your or your run or return is going to go by you. So right. it's a, uh, people don't, realize how much goes in the special teams mm-hmm. until a big play happens or uh, a returner gets hurt or your best special teamer goes down and you're just right. kind of like looking for guys to do it because you can't use your 22 starters on offense and defense. And then there's other um, role players that offense and defense don't want you to use. So you have to scrap up guys and find 11 guys who are going to yeah. be – going down there and, you know, trying to do their job to the best of their ability and are good at it. And it's hard to play in space because the special teams is all about playing in space. I mean, you know it as a long snapper running, running down after a punt. you got to be able to play in space. You can't just good be God, a 300-pound yes. 300, 300, lineman snap a ball and jogging down there. you got to run and cover a lane and make tackles and shed blocks and all that stuff. So mm. um, it's, a, it's a different world now than even, I mean, we'll just call it 2,000. In 2000, there was probably some third-string tight ends that were snapping in the NFL. Right. Or the backup center was the short snapper, and they had a their third or fourth linebacker as a deep snapper. And the punter was back there like, oh, God, where's this ball going? Hopefully it just gets to me. I can catch it and kick it. Mm-hmm. But now it's so specialized where each team, there's three specialists. It's already chalked up for the 53-man roster. Yeah. There's going to be a snapper, a kicker, and a punter. Mm-hmm. Some teams have four. I don't, even, I don't know if this past year, but some teams have four with the kickoff specialist. So yeah. uh, that's where the game's gone, and I don't know if it's going to – I hope it doesn't change. I kind of like the way the game is. So um, we'll kind of see how it plays out over the next couple of years. Yeah. So do you playing up in, in MetLife all the time, do you find that it's an advantage for you as far as when you go to other places? that Because I feel like you're kicking in some of the – you can when it starts to get later in the season, you're kicking some pretty terrible conditions. Yeah. Um Everyone asks what's the hardest place to kick in, and I always tell them a grass stadium that's outside. For I mean, oh, yeah. Chicago, Cleveland, Green Bay, um, Pittsburgh, et cetera. So you have to worry about two things. You have to worry about your footing. You know, if, if, if there's weather, you know, like rain or snow, you have to worry about footing. Where field turf, you know that the field's going to be there. You know it's not going to be moving too much. Where right. on grass, the grass could chunk out, slide out, be wet, nasty. So now Buffalo can be really hard to kick in, but I still would rather kick there than, you know, Chicago late in the year because I know what my footing is going to be in Buffalo. Where Chicago, you don't know what the grass is going to do. You don't know if it's going to just fall out and you're going to fall on your butt. And, you know, it's going to be a bad game for you all game. So, um, yeah, it's an advantage to a degree. I um, I think it is an advantage to kick uh, outside. And we practice outside every day we possibly can. You know, it was, we had a couple of days it was 10 degrees with, you know, wind chill of zero or maybe 20 degrees wind chill of 10. And we're practicing outside. Um, you just bundle up and you kind of get used to it. Um and, you know, we get some pretty tough wins to kick in a practice, which are very um, – they can be tricky, but they're very beneficial for me getting ready for sta- for tough stadiums, uh, Foxborough, MetLife, Buffalo, um, <coughs> Cleveland, et cetera. So um, it's kind of um, – it's it, it just – you just have to be confident. That's the biggest thing I could tell kickers is be confident. 
trust your swing, trust your line. Remember, I said earlier, every kick's a straight kick. That's one thing that Chris always taught me. So if you're aiming at the right center, make sure you aim at the right center. Don't say, I'm going to kick it right center, but I'm aimed on the middle because then your ball's going to do different things that it shouldn't do. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of where, I mean, I, a lot of stuff I do now, I do, okay, kind of like, what would Jesus do? What would Sailor do? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I ask myself <laughs> that all the time a little bit. Like, yeah. All right, I gotta. I'm, if I'm training on my own, you know, every now and again I get to send Chris a video or my brother Eric. He's one of Chris's right hand right. men when it comes to working camps out in LA or Vegas or whatever. So I train with Eric quite a bit because I get to see him more than Chris. Eric doesn't have a fan, doesn't have kids and a wife, um, where Chris has his kids and his girlfriend and stuff like that. So he's busy all the time. Even right. when he's not doing kicking stuff, he's probably behind the computer doing rankings or getting everything ready for the next camp. So. He just got so much going on that uh, I work with Eric a lot and, you know, I ask myself, all right, what would they do here? Or if I'm training, I'm, I, a kick doesn't go the way I want. I analyze it. And then I ask myself, weird, what would, what would Chris think of the kick or what Eric think? And that way I'm getting my perspective and I'm think I'm trying to figure out a different perspective because they're obviously not here where if I'm kicking with Chris or with Eric, they can, see it i can think about my reaction what i think and they can tell me right away obviously what happened what they saw happen so you mm -hmm. have your you have two opinions right away to where you can say okay i got it i got it figured out and you go better to the next kick so um that's kind of how i train sometimes which is helped for the most part for me so that's awesome that's so cool that he's still he's still in the back of your mind like that uh, yeah so i mean going forward so as we inch closer to this first top 12 series season and we go mm -hmm. to the film it is there anything that you would want to see in it like in a series like this or in a show like this uh, that you'd want the world to see coming from um, this world it's a tough question i mean i i think you'd want to see how young kids handle pressure and i don't know you know there's all kinds of rules ncaa high school rules that Chris has to follow to make sure that he's compliant and no kids are the preferential treatment or whatever happens. So you want to, I think the biggest thing as a kicker, you want to see how the young kids perform under pressure because a kid can go out by himself with no one around. He could say, or he could make a hundred kicks in a row, make 60, 70 yard field goals, have kickoffs, go through the uprights and all that stuff. But when kind of like when the lights come on or when you have an incentive or when you have your peers watching, you want to see that. You want to see how the kids perform when now with the series, when cameras are on them, because before, right. I mean, I know a top previous top 12 camps, he might've filmed a little bit, you know, just as um, educational stuff. Mm -hmm. But now this is like, this is going to be viewed by, hopefully lots and lots and lots of people. Mm -hmm. So now you're, you're, you're playing like where your high school, you're going to have the people in the stands. You're going to have the college coaches are going to see it. If you send in the film. Well, now this is going to be viewed by a, a lot of different people. This is going to mm -hmm. be viewed by probably some reporters. So probably colleges, obviously um, your peers are going to see it. Not just the kids at the top 12 camp either, not the 90 kids there. It's going to be, I'm sure it'll be up, and Chris and Rubio have a great following, and it's almost like a cult following. All those kids are going to watch it and say, oh, I can do that. And then they're going to start training. They're going to get better for it. And so for me, I'd like to see how kids handle the pressure and how you make how you create that pressure with all the rules and regulations. I don't know how you do it, but I'm sure that's Chris has a few ideas in mind. We do have a few ideas. And uh... – that's kind of interesting. We went and filmed the first Ve uh, for the first weekend was this uh, past Vegas in January, and it was really interesting to see kids react to it. I think they started doing Sailor and Rubio both started to go, and uh, we had like we had four cameras there, so we there was always a camera around them, and they'd bring yep. the camera and they'd have a kid come up and go, okay, um, you know they're in the they're they're testing for the finals. They say, okay, if you make eight kicks, you earn you earn a spot to top twelve, and it took literally seven tries before a kid actually did it. And these, really? these weren't scrubs either. These were his top kids. It was so fascinating to watch. 
You yeah. Know, oh, that, that, that's, the, that's the pressure that, you know, and there was one camp that I was at recently. This might have been the last offseason. He had a camp in, uh, like, kind of Dallas area. I mean, it might have been south of Dallas. I went down. I was back home and um, helping him out, training at the same time. I was beginning to kick a little bit. Mm. And I think it was there – he was doing a little fun competition with guys, and then he goes. They ended up being two kids left, and he said, "They, I don't know what happened. If it was they just kept making kicks, and then he put pressure on. I want to say by saying, all right, you make this.' So, so one kid had. I, I want to say I think one kid missed, and then he, the next kid was up. And he said, you make this. You not only win this part of whatever you have, you get a free." trip to may vegas right and so he brought the parents in too to yeah you know and so the dad's like oh you better make this you know I, we need a free trip to vegas i mean as far as free like free camp free camp rep. you know yeah yeah and so um the kid ended up making it but that's that's good because that's like a yeah. little bit of pressure to add on the kid the parents are like you know breathing on their neck a little bit which is hard to say because I, I don't know if i'd ever do that i'd be like all right just go have fun be, yeah just go kick the ball but uh yeah. That, that's a good that's good stuff because that's how you that's how it's that's how it you can create the pressure you can see how a kid reacts and then a, a kid can learn from that i you can learn from all right what how did i react to that situation and how will i how can i better myself for the next situation we get ourselves i get myself into like that whether that's a high school game winner um a chance to go to a top 12 camp a chance to win a top 12 camp or even further along college nfl kicks game winners op- season openers i find season opening kicks to be tough sometimes because you're you want to get the season started off right you want to keep everyone engaged you want to make sure you start your own your personal season off well right. so that first kick can be kind of tough sometimes but um that's kind of how you know it, it'd be good to see how the kids react when some pressure and then how they respond to that'd be another kind of fun thing too well there's a there's we're actually we're in the editing room we're cutting this one scene and it was with the juco kids and now juco's are interesting because you know they're 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 on a different battle than they are like as a scene you know they're they're on a different sort of path than a senior yep. you know so they're fighting for something different and there was this couple scenes where he started lining kicks up and and there's a couple kids who were there's one it seemed particular and we're i don't know if we're gonna release just yet but this one kid missed a kick and it was a, it was a battle and we had two cameras on and we had one kid on well, both kids and one kid missed it pretty bad. The other kid made it and we had both judge position and like kind of showing, cutting back and forth. And this kid standing off to the side and says, Oh, let's take a picture. Everyone's congratulating him, blah, blah, blah. And this kid walks over and sees another kicker just sees this kid sulking kind of like devastated a little bit. Yeah. Walks over to him and goes, hey, man, it's all good. And it's like, and he's giving like this little like kind of pep talk. Like, hey, man, it's all good. And Sailor right after goes, uh, where is so-and-so? And ended up being the same kid who walked over, you know, kind of consoled his kid. And he comes up and he misses a couple kicks. And Sailor's like, no, I want to see you again because I think I'm considering for top 12. And he missed him. And then he was in the same spot as that kid. <laughs> and he like TV to, gold. Oh, and he had to walk away. He had to walk away and go by himself. And then the instructor went over and talked to him. And it's this whole mind game that people play with, especially oh, for yeah. kicking. I mean, kicking, I mean, snapping is a different thing where, you know, um, you know, you just do your job and get out. And then until you yeah. until you mess up, then it's colossal and everyone's like, you're fired, get the hell out. Yeah. Whereas kicking is, you have those moments and it, it does, you know, you, you there's points to be to be made and, and it's, God, it's amazing. And it's just, it's, it's just, it's so psychological. And that's why I think I'm so, I can't wait to show the world about this. It's, it's such yeah, a... Yeah, it, it, it's not just a physical game anymore. It becomes, a lot of times you get a mental battle and you have to win that mental battle every time you can't let a time slip where you're going to, you know, your, your mind psychs you out or gets you nervous or your mind betrays you. You have to, you have to win that battle every single time. And that's the fun part. You train so long and you push yourself to the limits so that your mind, your body can react the way you want it to at any given moment. And, um, it's just a, it's a fun career. It's a fun job. And uh, I just hope to keep playing a few more years. 
Well, I mean, <coughs> it's fun watching you. It is. Uh, and I appreciate fun. it. It's, it's fun to see, you know, where you came from and, and knowing the story of where you started with Sailor and where you're at now. And you, if you, you totally, you have, you took the torch and you ran with it and you blazed a trail for everyone. And I hope you know that. No, I tried to. I uh, think a few more people behind me did a little bit more, but um, I kind of just, you know, kind of whacked the weeds out of the way a little bit. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, I appreciate you coming on. This is awesome. And it's great to hear from you. I can't wait for all the young kids to hear your voice and hear all your stories. So No, I, I appreciate it. I think it's it's been awesome. And uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah. And uh, keep crushing it. So what's next for you, actually? What do what, what you got going on next? <laughs> um. I'm actually getting my MBA right now, so I've been doing a lot of homework with that. Oh, cool. Um, kind of doing that, just kids, hanging out with my wife, hanging out with my family. Uh, go back to L.A. Actually, I'm getting inducted in my high school in the Notre Dame's Hall of Fame in hey. uh, about hey. a month here, so uh, that'll be kind of fun. But, um, you know, other than that, just getting ready for off-season stuff. We start our, pro- our off-season program, I think, April – 17th maybe something else we got like two months till that so a little vacation coming up here and then uh kind of get back on the grind that's awesome well best luck to you man and uh keep crushing it have fun thanks dude appreciate it thank you so much thanks nick all right